Welcome to the Proactive Security Podcast with Mike Hodges and Brian Hamilton. This podcast is dedicated to discussing violence prevention in healthcare. We want to inform, equip, and empower healthcare security leaders to prevent violence before it happens. And now, here's your hosts, Mike and Brian. Hey, everybody, I'm Mike. And I'm Brian. And this is the Proactive Security Podcast, Episode 12. We've got a very special guest today, the distinguished Connor Samuels. He's the Director of Safety and Security at Medical City Hospital in Dallas, and uh, he has a tremendous history in threat assessment. And Connor, we really appreciate you being on the show and wanted to uh, give you a chance to introduce yourself to our audience. Appreciate it. Very happy to be here. Tell us a little bit about your history. I am originally from North Carolina, moved up and down the East Coast, spent some time in Virginia, was with Richmond City Police Department for several years and was also with Prince George Police Department. Jumped out of the law enforcement world into the corporate world, which was the hardest transition I think I've ever made in my entire life. Stayed with the corporate world for a good 17, 18 years with telecom. And that was with Virginia and to Pittsburgh and then eventually down here to Dallas. Telecom, bought, sold, bought, sold. And uh, one of those transactions kind of left me where I was going to think I was going to stay retired for quite a while. But golf game is, like I said, not that great. So uh, got a job with Medical City Dallas in healthcare. And you know, it was really interesting during my uh, interview, I said, I don't know anything about healthcare. And they said, well, we don't know anything about you. And it's been just kind of, and actually coming up on my fourth year down here in just a couple more weeks. So that's kind of the, the short overview of everything. That's awesome. We, we appreciate you being here. I think it's interesting to hear you talk about some of the difficulties in transition you know, from policing to private security or corporate security, and then moving from corporate security, where you've, you've, you've had some big jobs with some big companies, and then uh, moving into healthcare, which I think is a transition for a lot of people as well. You know, I went straight from the military into healthcare security, didn't know anything about it. <laughs> and that was definitely a, a culture shock. But, you know, one of the things you and I have talked about, which I think spawned this conversation, is the role of threat assessment in security practice. You know, one of the things we've talked about is how threat assessment and and tools like threat management teams and things like that, how they've not really manifested well or been adopted well in healthcare security spheres. You know, there are individual practitioners out there that do a great job, but collectively, as a as a subset of the security industry, healthcare is really not grabbed onto uh, threat assessment and threat management very effectively. So, I'm curious, can you talk with us a little bit about why you think that is? You know, I, I can't really give the answer on why I don't think that healthcare has really adopted to the whole threat assessment, threat management piece. You know, I, I think in general, threat assessment, threat management, and this would include public, private, pretty much everybody, it's still relatively new. I got lucky in regards to when I was with telecom, I had a very supportive CSO who really had a seat at the table. And the executive protection program and the threat assessment was really driven by the board. And, you know, we talked about that. And so instead of having that top down approach, you know, we actually had the board that really mandated our executive protection program. And so I, you know, oversaw that for the entire U.S. and which gave me really an opportunity to go out to Gavin De Becker School. It's a week long school in, in threat assessment. And absolutely, that was probably one of the best things I've ever done in my entire life. You know, it really made my eyes a, a lot brighter in regard to the threat assessment piece. You know, coming from law enforcement, you know, if threats made, oh, we're going to investigate the threat. And, you know, that's kind of been the premise that was always there. But, you know, being in the telecom world, it was driven, it was pushed down by the board. And so it became a part of our processes and processes. I, you know, I had teams throughout the entire United States that we assess threats when threats were made. In, in healthcare, you know, just in my short four years here, I don't think workplace violence gets the recognition, and that would be 
targeted violence in regards to maybe threats, but also the reactionary violence from the day to day. I just don't think that it's gotten the awareness or received the awareness that it should be at. When I came into the healthcare and I started looking at a lot of the, the articles that were being pushed out by the Joint Commission and other organizations, they were very old and the data was very old. But 99% of the articles that I were looking at all talked about reactionary violence. And it did not really address worker on worker, intimate partner, spillover, threats of violence. It was all about you know, healthcare in regards to being assaulted or being a victim at work, you know, from a patient, or a lot of it was really addressing in-home healthcare. And that's really where I think this all started out. And, but, you know, I say that part, but I also look back and I also, you know, my opinion only is that a lot of the staff that I've met over the past four years are very caring people and they want to care and they want to do what's right. And so I think the reporting is also skewed a little bit and that, you know, it, I, I feel that some of them feel that it's kind of something that comes with the position, you know, that you, they know that the individual didn't really have that intent to do harm or, you know, hit them or kick them or bite them or, or there was some, you know, outside interference that might have been there, medication, you know, behavioral health or anything like that. So I think it's a couple different aspects that looks at it, the underreporting, and then I just don't think that the threat assessment piece has really taken, taken shape yet because it really hasn't taken shape in a lot of organizations. You know, ASIS and SHRM pushed it out several years ago, but I've worked with some departments, police departments that don't even have threat assessment teams. And they still are, well, yeah, he made a threat. That's a terroristic threat. And, you know, it's like, it, and I definitely understand it's a threat. I'm not, I'm not worried about the threat. We know he made the threat. You know, I'm worried more about can this individual go through and commit the act of violence? So it's kind of a long-winded answer. I apologize, but that's just, you know, my feeling on where healthcare is with threat assessment teams. No, I think that's some. I think that's insightful. I'm, I'm, you know, it's interesting to me. You talk about, you know, having the benefit of the board being, you know, involved in helping kind of mandate and push that responsibility from, from down to the to the organization. You know, one of the challenges I've always had, and I, I see this in what you're talking about with workplace violence and just the lack of recognition that it seems to get, despite the the overwhelming amount of data that is out there, uh, and then also the nuances of, of threat management and threat assessment as a, as a different discipline in and of, you know, what we typically see is security practice, which is the frontline officer doing the day-to-day. -day. How do we best articulate the benefits of a threat assessment program, a threat management program to a, to a, a senior leadership team that really has no, you know, history background in, in security whatsoever. We've got to be able to articulate that benefit to some degree. So how do we do that effectively? And I think, I think that's what helps us move the ball forward with program development, but that's the challenge. How do we articulate the benefit in our current environment? Well, and I, you know, and everybody can, the way you articulate it is really, as we all know, the reduction, right? The reduction of workplace violence. And, you know, and that's the ultimate goal, but also, knowing and or having individuals that have conveyed that there was a threat made, you know, being able to work that threat, look at that threat, and get involved in, and really assess the situation and find out whether or not that individual, you know, has that ability or has the mindset or wants to go through with a targeted violence. Uh, an act of targeted violence, you know, in being able to intervene, that it, it kind of shows the, the well-being of the program. And unfortunately, though, that, in my opinion, is not, it, it's not the, the selling point to the CEOs, right? That, that's kind of really not the, the catch-all for them. The, the, the selling and winning of it is really with HR, 
the VPs of HR and, you know, and the senior leaders that are directly involved in those employees that, you know, might have received the threat. Whether, you know, so if it was a nurse that, you know, maybe, you know, a mother passed away or a father passed away, a patient, and the son or daughter or family member, you know, makes a threat that, you know, oh, my mother died, you're, cut, you're next, or, you know, if my mother dies, you know, you're next. And again, it happens, it happens a lot, we all know it happens, but probably 90% of the time, that is not reported to security, because they feel that that's just it's nature, right? It, it, it's a part of being where I'm at. But, you know, slowly but surely, I'm getting those. I'm getting those and I want those. And being able to take that information, get all that information, try to find out as much as I can about that individual, right? And then being able to go back to the, the leaders there and kind of give a little bit of a background Yes, there is some history of violence. No, there is not a history of violence. This individual is a senior vice president of a bank, right? You know, this could have been an emotional outburst. Not saying that it's justified, but trying to give a little bit of background and context about it, whether this individual is a risk of violence is more of a selling point to that individual employee that received the threat and the leader of that department and are, you know, HR, right? The, the, the leader of HR. The CEO and the senior executives really don't get involved in that unless it's a threat against their life, right? And, you know, and everybody has different programs and algorithms now that monitor Twitter, social media, and where, they, where a big executive that's high at risk would see the benefit if it was impacting them. That's just, again, my, my opinion. I, I think that it's very good information that should be reported to the CEOs and to the senior leaders. But if they don't have the understanding of the, the threat assessment process and threat assessment teams, you know, it's going to be difficult for them to buy into it. You know, they're going to be more worried about, you know, oh, six nurses were assaulted this, you know, this past week and, you know, two of them, you know, are missing work. And that's costing money, you know, and so, and nothing against the CEOs, it's just that different mindset. But I think the real selling point is to HRs and the direct leaders of those departments. One thing that you made me think of there, Connor, there's a, a lot of conversations I have where we kind of touch on the fact that as individuals, a lot of times we will give ourselves the benefit of the doubt in situations and not necessarily do that for other people. But it seems like for nurses, they actually will uh, give that benefit of the doubt to the patients or the individuals who are exhibiting these aggressive behaviors towards them. And one of the things that you said there as well is that little by little, you're seeing an increase in, the, in that reporting. What are some of the things that you've been able to do to really engage those, those medical staff in you know, being more open to filling out those reports and sharing the information of those things that they may otherwise not report? We're pretty active. Our security officers are very active in rounding. We, we do a lot of rounding with the staff. And so as a leader, we always round, right? That was a new concept that was put on to me because, you know, we didn't round in telecom. But absolutely, I think it's, it's absolutely great, whether we would call it rounding or whatever in other, in other organizations. I think it's absolutely wonderful. But actually, so I took the rounding, we pushed it down to the security officer itself. So the security officer has to do roundings with staff. And it's kind of really, what can we do for you? But as you know, you know what the rounding is, right? It's really what we can do, for, you know, what we can do for you. And so we really have been pushing the report, 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 report. Before the COVID, uh, I actually held two different day trainings on targeted violence and workplace violence. And it was, they did it a lunch and learn. And so people could come in and, you know, the hospital provided lunch and I talked to them about targeted violence. I talked to them about the, the pathway uh, to violence and, you know, the grievance and to the end and how they can pay attention and how uh, to get us involved to look at it. You know, and, and as security professionals, you know, we have all experienced the call from HR at five to five on a Friday and they go, Hey, you know, we need you here. We're getting ready for termination. We have concerns. 
okay, so what, what, what's the concerns? Well, you know, this individual is afraid they're going to be violent during the termination. Okay, well, what gives you that? Well, he's been making threats for the past six months. You go, well, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, wait a minute, hold up. And so, you know, those to us, myself, you know, are, are learning that, you know, that's something that really can be keyed on in working with HR. And so a lot of the supervisors and leaders after that, those uh, lunch and learns, you know, it became a constant, you know, hey, I was writing up an employee, they made this comment, they made this comment. And, and again, you know, having, you know, the, as we would call it, zero or no workplace violence, depending on where you're at, you know, you have to address that and you have to separate those two, right? I mean, if threats are made, that's, that's a violation of workplace violence policy. That, that's an HR, they can deal with it however they want to do. As a security professional, you know, what we need to do is really get back to, you know, does this individual have the ability and the mindset to go through with the threat? And so, you know, getting that buy-in from the leaders ha has been really helpful. And, and again, it was interesting because you could see our workplace violence numbers increase after the training, because now there's more of a, oh, wow, we really need to, we really need to start reporting this a little bit more. And so, you know, it's been absolutely great. We, you know, it's talked about on the morning huddles uh, with all the hospital, with all the departments get on and, you know, and we, you know, those are issues that are brought forward. And then we reach out if we didn't catch it that night or they didn't call us that night, you know, they'll probably not call us at night, but they'll say something to the manager in the morning. Well, the manager reaches out to us and then we just, we, you know, we look into it uh, and we try to figure out really what's going on. We, we've spoken to people that have made the threats, you know, we've actually banned individuals from visiting that have made threats. And then some, we go, hey, you know, I get it. It's an emotional thing right now. Not going to happen again. You're not going to come back. So it's, you know, it's been great to see the leadership team get behind it. You know, you, you mentioned the training that you received or having the opportunity to go to the Gavin DeBecker School, which, uh, you know, you and I have discussed my deep jealousy that I have not been able to do that. And so uh, I'm curious, you know, when we talk about setting up you know, threat assessment practice in the context of a security program, you know, you, you gave some of that scope discussion there about what our role is in that assessment process. One of the things that I'm interested in and I'm a big proponent of is, is identifying, you know, specialties in that regard. So, you know, obviously there's active threat management that frontline officers do on a daily basis, taking in information and reporting, you know, doing, doing actions in real time, but then you know, how, how do you suggest or how do you look at building out threat assessment professionals to support your security team? And, you know, like I've tried to do that through an investigator role uh, associated with the, the public safety department, but then also have been evaluating that with combining some of our HR professionals, pulling them into to more targeted threat assessment training. Uh, what are your thoughts on trying to build out those skills within the context of your security program? For the, you know, for threat assessment, ATAP, which is the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, is an absolutely incredible organization. And I got connected with them probably six years ago. And they actually have now rolled out their certification, kind of like, you know, the CPP and the CFE, you know, they have their uh, certified threat manager. And it's uh, a lot of material. And I believe you and I have kind of, you know, I've shared you some of the material. And they absolutely have some incredible resources. And to test out and to become a certified threat manager, it's very, 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 very involved. It has a lot of good information. And that would probably be one of the best, you know, in game for somebody that was going to be the full time threat assessor are, you know, assessing threats within an organization. Frontline security officers, you know, I don't know. You know, I don't know if that is what you would want them involved in because, you know, after, you know, once you get the assessment or you start looking into assessing and a risk of uh, violence, you know, it's definitely not a 10 minute job. It's not a, you know, two hour job. It could be a week. It could be, you know, I, I, I've actually had some that have gone on for, over years now that I still follow the individual. 
I still communicate with the rest of the team on whether I'm seeing, you know, different social media posts and or not social media posts, whether there's any more communication that's going on. And, you know, that that really depends on what's going on in that individual's life. So, you know, for that frontline officer, it's it's really like what we all know about being aware of the surroundings, seeing what's going on, you know, looking at the reaction that's going on while they're there. If they get called to that, you know, to this to the incident, you know, why it's there. So they're the one that really give you that firsthand look of what's going on. But, you know, training, training, I think, is probably not the frontline officer. It's going to be somebody that does a lot more of the, the true digging with the rest of the teams and, you know, and getting advice and insight from, you know, the kind of the threat management team from a lot of the different individuals that are involved in the, uh, in the process. It's tough. You know, I don't think that I would ever want to put my frontline officers in, in that spot of assessing an individual for, for the long term. Right. For the reactionary right then and there, you know, it, there, there's really two different mindsets that are going on because, you know, the, the targeted violence is more in regards to the, the threat assessment process of it. No, and I think in, you and I have talked about this a little bit as well. I think you know, that, that kind of active threat assessment process of being able to determine actions that need to be taken in real time, that reactionary assessment process is tremendously valuable for your frontline officer. But to your point, and I think, and you know, this is something that people I think don't necessarily understand about threat assessment is you can, you can follow that threat for years. And we've seen cases across the United States especially with, with, you know, active, uh, active shooter presentation where we've had individuals who have, you know, held that grudge or held on to that grievance for, you know, five years, six years, seven years before they ever actually finally get to the place where they manifest the, the act of violence. And so it is, a, it is a dedicated process of tracking, trending, monitoring, and, and con- continuing to follow that case over what can be, to your point, years to make sure that 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 violence doesn't actually manifest, which is a lot of work. Yeah. And, you know, and again, that that is that the long term process, you know, for some of the things that we've done, you know, on the the front end of the quick end is using our reporting software. You know, we started tracking and trending individuals on hold. We started tracking individuals and we track them actually throughout the hospital, you know, so they come into the ED or the emergency room and they're placed on a hold. You know, we we enter a call and we just keep it as a live call and, you know, it will go off every 30 minutes on our dashboard and, you know, and we check in and we find out, you know, any changes, what's going on, what's the difference, medicated, not medicated, any anger, not anger. You know, we do a lot of rounding and then what we do is we actually track that individual throughout the hospital. And so when they end up going on the floor, as you know, as I've learned, you know, the ED knows all this information and sometimes that information doesn't get really pushed onto the floor. And then, you know, one of the other things I've learned is that if I check back in, you know, if I was at the hospital and I created a disturbance, you know, two months ago and I checked back in next week and nobody knew that I got in a fight with 15 people last time I was here. And so we've been able to track that and we actually flag that and so when the individual comes back in you know we can run it through our reporting software and it will identify you know hey this one let you know got in a fight last time he was here you know bit a nurse last time he was here it it eloped last time they were here and so that actually kind of it gives us more of an awareness of what's going on at that given time but it also allows us to when that individual comes out of the ed and goes up to a floor that we can actually now meet with the, the team on the floor and say, hey, just want to let you know the last time this individual was here, this happened, you know. So, you know, so it, it, it does kind of give the, uh, the awareness and puts everybody that, okay, not saying anything is going to happen, but something could happen. So that's kind of more of the, if we're talking about that real time, what we've done. And I mean, and we track them all through the hospital and then, you know, when they get discharged or they move on to another facility is then when we will actually, you know, close that, the, the call out of our dispatch system. But it does flag, you know, every 30 minutes. And so it gives us an idea to, 
send an officer back to where they're at now and you know just to check in could be just sleeping but it does give a good presence to the staff there and it also keeps our security uh, aware of what's going on because you know we're we're you know 900 plus beds and so you know when you're nine officers and you got 900 beds you know you, you got to try to keep a, at least an eyeball on you know potential risk if you know about them well i think that you know you talk about the difference you know like the the encounter we had a month ago compared to the encounter we have today compared to you know the encounter you had two years ago uh one of the one of the key benefits i see to an effective threat assessment and threat management program, and especially having that kind of that kind of central clearinghouse that that specialist who's kind of dedicated to the assessment process, you do have a, a stronger ability in, in my mind to pull all of those disparate encounters together to get a more holistic picture of the challenges you have with a particular individual or a particular threat. And I think that is a benefit that often goes unmeasured or you know, without a little understanding there is, you know, it all kind of feeds into the ability to empower that frontline officer to react more effectively in the moment when they encounter that subject or to feed more effective information in the organization so we can mitigate and plan better for that particular individual. I agree. And, you know, and I know that, you know, a lot of the hospitals, you know, will put magnets up on the doors, you know, fall risk or, you know, maybe another risk or there's something out there. And, and we haven't gone to that yet. You know, it's been proposed, uh, you know, right now that that information, you know, they'll, they'll keep in a chart if we let them know. But, you know, the EBS individual that's going to go in there and clean that room while the patient's in there doesn't know about that chart that says this individual is at a risk of violence. And so, you know, I've made recommendations to, you know, create the little magnet sign. It doesn't have to say fall, it could be an explanation point, it could be a stop, it could be, you know, anything that the staff is all trained on that, you know, is just a visual type of recognition that you're going into a room that there could be a risk or we've experienced a concern in the past and just, you know, be a little bit more aware of your surroundings when you're in there. Uh, you know, and especially, you know, if the individual, you know, is prone to, you know, assaults, right? You know, you still, the, the staff still has to go in the room, but, you know, maybe keep that arm's length, you know, from the whole law enforcement world that you don't want to get too close to them. Uh, but sometimes you can't, right? But if you know that, take two people in there, you know, so there, there is more of the awareness that's there. And, and again, I think that, you know, a lot of organizations do that. I hope that a lot of organizations do that, you know, and it's things like that that I think are, are very helpful to reducing, you know, that reactionary violence, you know, because that's right then in the moment. And a lot of it is, it could, I don't even want to say what a lot of it really is. It could be behavioral. It could just be uh, an altered state. It could be, you know, multiple different things that make that person act the way they do at that particular time. But if we have knowledge or, you know, I, I think that we as an organization should be able to get that knowledge to the staff to better prepare them for something. Again, my opinion. <laughs> well, and we appreciate your opinion. I think, uh, I think very valid. I think, you know, knowledge, you know, a big part of the whole, the whole concept behind threat assessment is we gain knowledge in the process. And then we are able to better use that knowledge. You know, and it fits with the whole concept of, of a protective intelligence program. It, it ties back into that idea of developing intelligence, right? We, we have a better understanding of our threat landscape. We have a better understanding of the threats that exist in that landscape. We have a better understanding then of how to protect ourselves. And that can be based on the reactionary violence we see between a patient and a nurse or, you know, the threat assessments that we're doing based on threats made by a patient or a family member, et cetera, or uh, just general uh, issues associated with, you know, our executive teams or other high profile individuals connected to our organization. So there's so many different opportunities for threat assessment to help build knowledge and then that knowledge to help us better inform our 
uh, protection, which is the goal. No, I agree. I, you know, like I said, I, I never really thought that I would be involved in it uh, like I got involved in it, right? And, you know, after, you know, attending the, the Gavin School and then, you know, joining up with ATAP, I, I, it has probably been one of the best things that I've ever done. I, 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 I support it. I think the knowledge that the individuals that I have met over the years that I've become very good friends with is it just blows me away every time I speak to them. And, you know, one of the things I like about, you know, ATAP is it doesn't matter why I call or if I post out onto our, 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 our chat board, people respond and they will call and they want to be involved. And, you know, I, I, being in this world for quite a while with the security profession, you know, you have a lot of different organizations and sometimes a lot of those different organizations, when they bring, you know, it's kind of a selling point, right? Sell the vendor or, you know, the vendor trying to sell you something. You know, that is one thing that I will 100% say that ATAP doesn't do. That, that it's, we have, a, we have a goal, we have a job, you know, and I've met individuals. I, I work very closely uh, with a guy up in Minnesota, Minnesota, great guy. I, you know, and Randy and I met years ago at a conference and you know and he is in a small police town up in Minnesota and is absolutely an incredible resource and any of them are a, are a great because I don't I wish I knew half of the stuff that they knew I really do you know mine comes from the investigative piece and being the law enforcement and being able to I want to be nebby and I want to know what's going on and I want to see what's going on and, and I do I mean I I, I have just like other probably people do. I have fake accounts, you know, with Facebook and other, you know, organizations that I, you know, get into different chats and different social pages and watch and listen what they're talking about and who they're talking about. And, you know, that was really driven from the telecom world because we were doing a lot of events, big major events, uh, you know, and so we had a lot of heavy talent. And so as you and I both know, not everybody likes everybody. And so, you know, we monitored, you know, the chat lines, I monitor chat lines. I mean, I have people on Facebook that have more friends than I do on Facebook. I mean, and they, they never lived. I mean, they're just fake people, but you know, they got more friends than I do, but you know, a lot of people, a lot of people talk and a lot of people express themselves. And so, you know, I've learned a lot of these different little tricks and trades through ATAP and, you know, and I will call them, I called them recently, you know, friends there and said, look, I got this, 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 and this, you know, what are your thoughts? And it's open discussion, you know, and we, we exchange and I've actually, you know, been referred to some other organizations to try to get in with other healthcare, healthcare organizations to talk about the threat assessment process and threat management teams, you know, because it's still evolving in general, right, in, in, in really in everywhere, but healthcare is really, a, you know, just a little bit behind, and, but it's getting there, right? You know, with the recent, you know, Joint Commission, you know, I think that it's going to get a little bit more foothold, you know, and I think that if they continue to push, I think healthcare, you know, is going to have to take it, and they're going to have to run with it, you know, it, we just all hope that when it rolls out through the healthcare organization, that it's rolled out correctly and not just kind of, you know, given to somebody that really doesn't want it, right? You give it to the people that really want it and, you know, and, and make it work like it should work because the process does work, you know, uh, intervening in that path, you know, does work. I've seen it work. Again, will it always work? No, there's never a hundred percent, you know, we're, it's not about predicting anything, but, you know, try to intervene, you know, in that path. And so I'm hoping that, you know, with the Joint Commission standards coming out and changing, I'm hoping that, you know, more healthcare organizations are going to be able to adopt it and, you know, really own it. You know, just don't adopt it, check the box and go, yeah, we have a team, you know, but do it, train, you know, whole tabletops, you know, tabletop testing, we all know is, 
yeah, yeah. But doing a tabletop test, you know, we would do them with a tabletop test with a threat assessment team. And then we would actually set the team in the, in the tabletop, it would fail, right? So they missed the assessment. It ended up turning into a workplace violence. And so then we would spend day two as, yep, now you have a shooting inside your organization. So now the business continuity team's in. So, you know, how are you going to recover now? You know, and, and I say it over and over again in our staff meetings that, you know, the ED is wonderful, they're great, but if we ever had a shooting inside the ED, right, you know, now what are we going to do? What's the recovery path, right? You know, because you just lost your ED. It's a crime scene. It's not a one hour, it's a six, seven, where are we going to go with this now, right? And so, taking that the tabletop of a threat assessment, building it all the way through, letting it not work like it should, and then turning into the business continuity the next day is absolutely a, a, you know, an eye-opener for everybody. And that's where the CEO is like, wow, okay, now I get it. Because they participate, but they just sit on the backside of it. That's my big wish on how it goes. That's great stuff, Connor. And I, I appreciate you sharing uh, your experience and some of your knowledge with us. I think um, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, we're, we're lagging a little bit behind, but we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and there's just such tremendous opportunity there. And man, I'm going to, I'm absolutely going to steal that idea about transitioning your tabletop into a business continuity discussion. Cause that's, that's fantastic. You know, we're up against time. Is there any kind of last thoughts you want to share with our uh, audience before we jump out of here? No, I appreciate the time. I, I appreciate you, you know, letting me talk about it. You know, by no means am I the expert on it by any means. Uh, you know, there are definitely a lot of great organizations and, you know, it's, it's an evolving, uh, you know, thought process. You know, it, and I wouldn't even say evolving. It's here now. And, you know, the ATAP has done a great job in getting school assessments, you know, because one of the things we didn't talk about was schools, right? But if you've noticed, a lot of school districts now have adopted the threat assessment teams. And, and we've seen that, right, because of most of the, what we were talking about earlier with the school shootings, right? There's always that, oh, well, yeah, we, you know, we had reports on this. We had this, and, you know, there was never any engagement in it. And so, you know, it's, it's coming and it's coming really in a full, you know, it's really coming straight at everybody. And it's, I think how we adapt to it and use the resources, use the process, you know, and, and learn from it. I think that we do have a, you know, we have a really good, uh, we have a great opportunity to, you know, reduce the risk of targeted violence in organizations, whether it's healthcare, corporate, um, you know, any, anywhere. I, I think that it's, it, it's a, it's something still, you know, not, I don't want to say not supported by any means. I think it's supported, but I just think that it's still selling it to get it out to everybody. It's the important part of it. Awesome. Connor, you really uh, did a great job of summing that up, bringing all of those, uh, all of those different nuggets together. You know, whether we talk about rounding, reporting, uh, you know, those slow, those slow changes to the culture that really help increase the reporting. A lot of great information now. For anybody who wanted to uh, get more of your insights, what are the, the best ways to reach out to you? I'm out on LinkedIn. It's, it's actually J.Connor Samuels. Uh, but I think you and I are friends. I know Mike and I are friends. And, you know, that's probably the best way. Perfect. So, yes, for anybody listening, J.Connor, C-O-N-N-E-R, Samuels. Uh, Connor, again, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for joining us today. And again, I, I think uh, another great conversation and lots of benefit for everybody tuning in. Thanks, Connor. We appreciate it, man. Thank you. Awesome. Well, th thank you for joining us for episode 12 of the Proactive Security Podcast. Join us next month when we celebrate one year of the Proactive Security Podcast. For more ways to connect, feel free to check out our LinkedIn page. Check out the link tree that's in the description of this episode. That'll take you to uh, all of the all of the other resources, including Mike's proactive security blog, which was kind of the launching pad for this podcast. Thanks again for joining us. And until next month, stay proactive. <laughs>